You may all know he has a very popular uh, six episode series that I recommend you all watch. Uh, my kids unfortunately watch it with me and they say, he's really smart, what's wrong with you? <laughs> he of course is a New York Times bestselling author uh, and the associated series got nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> no, we're just waiting for them. He was featured on the cover of Italy's Style magazine. So I'm gonna to talk to you. Let's go to the brain. And the brain is David Eagleman. It's like the conscious mind is a stowaway on a transatlantic steamship that's taking credit for the whole journey without acknowledging the massive engineering that's underfoot. Um, so think about when you have an idea and you say, oh, I just thought of something. It wasn't actually you, right? Your brain's been working on that for days or weeks, putting together information, trying things out, evaluating hypotheses. Eventually, it comes up with something, feeds it up to your conscious brain, and you say, oh, I'm a genius, but it wasn't really you that thought of it, right? So this is the, this is the issue with the unconscious brain. And, and as Carl Jung said a long time ago, in each of us there is another whom we do not know. Or as Pink Floyd put it, there's someone in my head, but it's not me. Essentially everything that we have is an internal model. Your brain is yeah. screaming along with activity all the time, and that's modulated just a little bit by data that comes in through the, through the senses. The valuable stuff is the surprise, is yeah. the stuff that you weren't already predicting was going to happen. Um, yeah, that's a big part of the brain. It's, it's a predictive engine. So, um, Which allows you to automate incredibly complex tasks like walking yeah. and driving and riding it, a bike, Exactly et right, exactly right. What we're always seeking is this sweet spot between novelty and familiarity. So, if I say, hey, I'm a great composer, I'm gonna write something, and I write something that's all surprise, you're not gonna like it, because it's, because because there's no rhythm and beat, and then if I have little surprises, then it's, then it's interesting a delight to moment. you. So why exactly. are we seeking that? Because we're seeking things that do not match the model, because that's really important that information. That gives us delight. Is. Yeah, it gives us delight. That happens to be the quality that we experience with it. But And, and what's the role of the part that just makes us feel comfortable? Um, it's because the brain's a predictive engine. If it can't predict anything, it's uh, really going to be uh, anxious. We're, we're just sampling a tiny little bit of the world. And, and what's interesting is when you look across the animal kingdom, it's clear that you have other animals picking up on totally different bits of the world. So in the blind and deaf world of the tick, it's picking up on temperature and body odor. And for the black ghost knifefish, it's picking up on perturbations in electrical fields. And for the echolocating bat, which is blind, it's just picking up on returning air compression waves. And this is the part of their world that they pick up on and none of the rest of it. And we have a word for this in science. It's called the Umwelt, which is the German word for the surrounding world. And the Umwelt is that part of your ecosystem that you're picking up on. Those signals that, that you get to detect. You know, here at Bell Labs, one of our quests, in fact, for 90 years, the quest has been uh, communications. And, and uh, originally, if you look back in the literature, uh, we have the first papers about Bell Labs talk about our quest is to solve the human need problems in telephone and telegraph. That quest became then data communications, data transfer across web technologies. But in future, I, I think it's, it's about human cognitive transfer or sensory transfer or something like that, because we have to recreate the physical experience of us being together, but over digital distances, which are going to be increasingly large and remote, et cetera. So what's your thinking on that? Can we do sensory cognitive transfer across digital networks, possibly using enhancements like your vest? Yes, I think so. And so the vest is this vest that we've made in the lab. It's got 32 vibratory motors on it, and we can pass any kind of data stream into that. So you're feeling patterns of vibration. I've, I've got this phone, and as I'm speaking, the sound is getting captured. And then the key thing is that it's transmitting Bluetooth, and I'm wearing a vest that has uh, vibratory motors on it. So as I'm speaking, the sound is getting translated to pattern of vibrations on my torso. So I'm feeling the auditory world around me as I speak. So it's a haptic experience. So, so the idea with that is that we've been testing this now on deaf people for a little while. And deaf people can come to understand what is spoken. The reason being that this is all your cochlea is doing. Your cochlea is just taking the one-dimensional signal, breaking it up into different frequencies, and sending that along different cables to the brain. All of your work, in fact, is about creating an umwelt that goes beyond what we can experience. And the goal must be not just for fun, but to make humans 
more sensitive to their environments and better able to perform tasks. What, what, what is the, the big thing that you'd like to achieve? If the Umvelt gets bigger, what would you like to believe humans are like sort of 10, 15 years from now? As far as what the world's gonna be like, I really envision that we'll be able to build new senses, completely different senses, so not vision, not hearing, not touch, smell, taste. So you've like, got a term for it, smuggenenuf or something. Uh, Shmigegi. Shmigegi. Yes, <laughs> Shmigegi is what we'll call the next sense, <laughs> sense and then yeah. after that I'll need to make up another word and so on. Because the idea is, um, yeah, if, if the way we experience a sense has to do with what the structure of the data is, what kind of data is coming in, there's no reason we can't feed you know, real-time data from the internet and get a completely different sense. I love this idea, and you explain it so incredibly well, that, yeah, I have pre-built-in sensors, but in the end, as soon as it gets behind that sensor, it's just electrochemistry and neurons. Exactly. So as long as I can get a, a data in through some channel, as soon as it's in, it, it's the same as seeing or hearing uh, in terms of the brain's ability to process it. Exactly. Which is amazing. Yeah, it's just, it's all electrochemical signals on the inside. Your brain isn't seeing or hearing any of this. Your brain is actually locked in a vault of silence and darkness in your skull, and all it ever experiences are electrochemical signals, and that's it. It's got these different data cables coming in, carrying spikes, and that's all it has to work with. And it simply doesn't care. Whatever the kind of information is that's coming in, it just figures out what it can do with it. Like, is it correlated with other senses coming in? And can I make motor acts that somehow correlate with it? So one of the things that, that uh, I'm very interested in, and I know that you share an interest in this, is this issue of can we measure physiologic signals from one person, pass them to another person? And I think there are scenarios where you'd want to do that and scenarios where you don't, but let's imagine you want to do that. <laughs> We've, we talked about a marital examples are maybe one way you would want to. Let's say with your spouse, you want to feel her physiologic signals. So uh, you have sensors on her and um, you can then feel when she's nervous, when she's happy, exactly. things like that. You know, your friend is at the big Super Bowl game and the question is, can you feel what he's feeling? Um, uh, yes, the issue is just about putting the data into a space where I, as the receiver, can understand, oh yeah, that's excitement. Every time I feel excited, I feel that pattern, and so now I've associated that pattern with that feeling. So uh, here's an experiment in my lab. This participant is feeling a, a real-time feed of data. You can see on a different version of the vest here, he's feeling the data, and, and after five seconds, he has to make a choice. He gets a, a yellow and a blue button, he makes a choice, he doesn't know what this is about yet, and he gets feedback, a frowny face or a smiley face. Now, he doesn't have any idea what this pattern of data means and what these choices are making, but we're actually feeding real-time stock data, and he's making buy and sell decisions. <laughs> Can we expand the human umwelt to take in the economic movements of the planet so that you actually are you know, plugged into the stock market and you know how things are going, you feel like, well, I feel like you know, oil just dropped or something weird is happening. <laughs> so that's the... Yeah, this is one of the things we're trying. It's been great chatting with you. Uh, you last too. question, what was it like to be at Bell Labs? I don't know if you've ever been here before, but was it, was it a fun day? I've not been here before and I loved it. I had a very packed schedule. That's what we do. Which, right, and several people <laughs> apologized to me about it, but actually I really thought that was terrific because I got to get a you know, fire hydrant stream in there and I thought of uh, sort of three or four areas where are the, way, the things I'm thinking about and the things that you guys are thinking about overlap in interesting ways that I would have never thought of, maybe you guys wouldn't have thought of, you know, just by putting this together. So I'm really appreciative for the invitation. Well, you did a fantastic job. We loved having you here. So thanks very much. Great, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>